Hey everyone, welcome back to Linux Weekly, daily Wednesdays where we sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of Linux and open source. I'm Vin Stone, joined every week by Jill and Brian. And everybody watching us live. Hey, how's it going? Bunch of fun things, man. Yeah. Uh, we were playing uh, our points match last Friday and we were talking in the after shows. And I was reminded about a game, um, ReCore, which came out from Microsoft. Yeah, that's that Microsoft game. <laughs> a couple of years ago, and yeah. it just disappeared. And it was a big deal. Like It was one of their like premier announcement games at the Microsoft Game Expo, whatever they were doing at the time. And they were going to make a franchise about it. And I did a little research on it. Turns out it was like locked into Windows 10, and it was only available on the Microsoft Game Store. You remember the Microsoft Game Store? Yeah. Yeah, Microsoft oh, yeah. thought they were going to pull that. Yeah. And we were talking about it, and I was like, did that ever come to PC? And it did. And it was on Steam. It was like three dollars. Yeah, it was on sale. Um, I grabbed it too, Vin. <laughs> I picked it up. And I'm like, yeah. you know, for three dollars, let's just go see what the hype was. Uh, that's a now, admittedly, admittedly, this is like the digital deluxe edition that they went back and fixed all the problems that it initially had. Mm. It's a pretty good game for three dollars. Uh, probably got like twenty hours in it. It's one of those games that uh, really doesn't tell you what you need to do. It gives you like the oh. broad strokes, so it forces you to go explore things. Okay. And we were talking about Dune. Reminds you a lot of Dune because the entire world is just a desert world where you got to run around, fight robots. You got a Robo Puppers though, which is pretty cool. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> yeah, you know, the graphics looked great on that for the time it came out. They still look good. They cool. still look good, and I think the thing that made my jaw drop a little bit is it was done in Unity. That was the first thing I... Yeah. It's like, wait a minute, this is a Unity game? Huh. Awesome. Well done. Well done. Also, we got to find some new intro music, Joe Ryan. Oh, yeah. I heard you were talking about that. that there's uh, The music we were using is uh, has a copyright claim on it now. They changed can't... the license on the music. Oh. So this is how... No. Could have been a lot worse. Could have been a lot worse, but we used, you know, I just went to the YouTube music library years and years ago, and I sorted by, like, dance, wub, you know, just something that was comically yeah. different. <laughs> and I found it from Ben Sound Dubstep. It's the intern, you've probably heard it in other YouTube videos. It, just, it was just wub, wub, wub. I'm like, ah, that's funny. And it was just, uh, you know, Creative Commons, the YouTube music library. What they did is they went back and relicensed it. So, mm. fortunately, YouTube had the foresight of going, you can't, well, I mean, you can do that, but you can't put a copyright against people who have Older used videos. it. Right. Yeah. Good. Thank God. Yeah. I was like, ooh. <laughs> that would have been scary. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I had to, like, learn all of this, like, after the show last Wednesday. I'm like, what is going on? Because I get the show uploaded, and it's like, copyright claimed by like, what are you talking about because i've been having this problem on twitch i want to do an entire like investigation on there's dozens of like fake profiles that have been claimed that have taken youtube music uploaded it to their youtube channel and used that as the basis of saying that they have the rights to that music so I have to go back and dispute this stuff. And I thought it was another case of that, right? Somebody said, yeah. and uh, no, I went to ended up, ended up at the Ben Sound website. And like, no, no, we've done this and we've relicensed everything. I'm like, wow, well, it's kind of an uh, interesting move there, Brad. So we're on the lookout. Okay. I found something that's moderately wobby. We'll, we'll oh, try good. It. We'll, we'll try <laughs> something it. Something happy and bubbly. <laughs> I, I didn't say anything cringe-inducing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll try it at the end of the show. I'm, I'm going to, there's your warning. So for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to find something that sticks because I've been meaning to redo like the spinny intro for the video viewers. Yeah. And I know you were playing around with Blender again, Vin. <laughs> so I was. I, figured. I was. My better <laughs> instincts have kicked in along with a lack of time so far this week. So I, I've, have, I've gotten to the part of installing Blender and getting the project up and loaded and looking at it and going... I, I need to go mop the floor or something more important. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, that's what we're doing. How about you, Joe Bryant? You are uh, celebrating another yeah. trip around the sun. <laughs> yes, I sure am. So it's my birthday this coming Monday, and I'm going to Disneyland once again to celebrate with my Steve husband. And that's going to be a lot of fun. A lot of fun. And on Saturday night, my family is going to have a barbecue for me. So that's cool. 
Yeah, it's what happens when you, you, you're in your mid 50s. <laughs> oh my goodness. I can't. Barbecues? Believe. Is that what happens? <laughs> no. You show up and you're like, well, this is barbecue for. And they're like, hey, man, mid 50s, you got to do it. No yeah. choice. <laughs> no, it's cool. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just happy that I can go to Disneyland whenever I want. So I get to go now on my birthday there you <laughs> every <go>. year. <laughs> so. We got a couple of things to talk about, and we're going to start off with Kernel 6.3, which, hey, sometimes nothing crazy is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. So Linus Torvalds, uh, he just released Linux Kernel 6.3, and it actually has some major new features. The new kernel comes with more support for Rust, Woo-hoo, which is a really good thing, including user mode Linux support for the Rust code. And Miguel Ojeda, the Linux kernel developer who led the efforts to bring Rust to Linux, said they are getting closer to a point where the first Rust modules can be upstreamed. Yeah, it, uh, development is happening really quick on that. This is awesome. And also, as usual, there is support for upcoming Intel and AMD CPUs and GPUs that aren't released yet. But those updates also help improve the speed of older processors and devices. So that's, that's really good to hear. And for us Steam Deck users, the new kernel provides a native Steam Deck controller interface in HID, or Human Interface Devices. This is a big deal. Now the Steam Deck's part of the, <laughs> part of the kernel. No, and... no, no, no. So this is another reason the AI is going to be upset with us. What, what about the AI did? <laughs> Artificial <laughs> interface devices for the robots. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, that's a good point, Van. <laughs> and uh, this Linux kernel also includes compatibility for the Logitech G923 Xbox Box Edition racing wheel and improvements to the 8-bit Do Pro 2 wired game controllers. That's a good thing. I use the 8-bit Pro, uh, 8-bit Do Pro 1 wired controller, and I love it. But there were some issues with the the... Uh, two version. And there is also support, and this is something that I'm really excited bit with, there's also support for more Wi-Fi adapters and chipsets, including one of the devices I am really happy for support in the Linux kernel is then the Realtek RTL 8188EU Wi-Fi adapter. It's about time. <laughs> it's now plug and play. <laughs> I'm too old. <laughs> Wi-Fi is still too much of a mystery. Here's my here's my expectations for Wi-Fi. Oh, it connected. I'd get a yeah, website. It, it connected. Yeah. So I'm just I was so thrilled about this because I have several of the these Realtek uh, Wi-Fi adapters and I've spent quite some time getting to work on Linux by manually installing the drivers and it could be just a little bit of a pain. <laughs> depending on what kernel you were on and everything. So it's just nice to have those plug and play. You got to think like when you see the um, Realtek <laughs> chipset, it's like that secret code for like, maybe. Yeah, maybe that was, we're getting closer to most of the Realtek devices being supported <laughs> in the chipsets, which is really great. And uh, also there is a uh, Qualcomm Wi-Fi 7 wireless chipset support, and Ethernet support for NVIDIA Bluefield 3 DPU. So all, all good news. The more driver support, the better. <laughs> so on it's a scale to what is mind. NVIDIA Bluefield DPU? <laughs> what do you think that is, Joe? Yeah, so I remember reading about it, and um, I think it's for server side. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, mm -hmm. <laughs> server said one yeah if you had to guess uh server side bluetooth no because it's ethernet <laughs> i don't know <laughs> we're gonna find Good out question. together we'll i don't find know out. I'm, I'm like, okay because <laughs> you said it was networking and we yeah. know nvidia bought melanox because oh, okay. uh all of the fiber cards in the studio three four five Five of them are Mellanox. They get the job done, all the tin kick fiber. And I'm like, okay, Bluefield. Yeah. That doesn't sound like a video card. Sure no. enough, it's not. That's uh, mm -hmm. That looks like a SFP 100 gig. No, 400 gig. Never mind. Oh, oh, oh okay. So I, that, that's a neat card. Yeah. 
that that was you know what i remember in the last kernel release the linux kernel 6.2 they were they were talking about uh the support coming for the new five gigabit and higher uh connections so but, that makes sense yeah where's the display port though i don't understand no. this video card's weird man <laughs> You know, we like to give NVIDIA a hard time, and I think the community as a whole about having closed-source video drivers, even though they've up so open-sourced a significant chunk, enough to where proper steps to making a truly open-source version of them are now possible. You know, we get the, uh, that's not good enough. But I also want to remind everybody, NVIDIA has over 300 repositories on GitHub. Yeah. NVIDIA is pretty deep when it comes into open-source. So, yeah. I yeah, know I'm what? a shill, right? Isn't that right, yeah. Linus? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I always throw that up there. Go watch the video version if you're wondering what I was pointing at. Uh, the real Linus, not the squeaky one. <laughs> Speaking yes. of Linus, Tack wrote on the kernel mailing list. He says, hi, Linus. Nice to meet you. I'm the new maintainer of the FireWire subsystem taking over from Stefan Richter. Please pull FireWire updates. He's got all this going on. Fireware still works on Linux. Yeah. It's been running on good. Linux for a long time. And Tack, you might have heard me talking about Tack. I've been back and forth with Tack on multiple occasions because mm -hmm. he maintains the also Firewire stack for audio. And that's something he's developed. He's like, hey man, I want to get Fireware support into the kernel. And that he's the one responsible for if you buy a Firewire audio interface and you plug it in. It just shows up in Pulse Audio, Pipewire, or anything like that. You're like, oh man, that's awesome. pretty neat. So he is going to take the entire stack now because, you know, Stefan's like, get a piece up. And Tack's like, I'm going to give you six mm -hmm. years. He is. He, he's going to maintain the 1394 stack with, uh, until 2026. Now, um, in 2026, he's going to start a strong announcement for users to migrate their workload from the 1394 bus by purchasing alternative devices and USB. Mm -hmm. ah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, here's the thing. Um, I'm excited to see what TAC does because TAC's also a big proponent for Rust. The FireWire sound control services is all done in Rust. The reason I even know anything about Rust is building that stuff and playing around with it. So to see what he's going to get up to. Now, he does make a point. And he's like, listen, this is going to be for audio stuff. This is not going to be for your hard drives. This is not going to be for your camcorders because those things are antiques. No one's using those right now they're plugging them in or they're trying to maybe do some restoration stuff and you know having known firewire support in the linux kernel until 2029 is pretty big and you don't have to worry about it going away linux is open source so even if yeah. uh, official support in the kernel is not there somebody's going to keep it limping along exactly yeah and firewire audio interfaces you know i i've i think i own like 14 of them so far because i'm trying to build a database Thank you, patreon.com forward slash Linux Game Guys. Mm -hmm. um, PCI Express add-in cards are plentiful. They work. They're very reliable. And the thing about audio interfaces is, you know, what current audio interfaces, you know, especially like in Lumen, they wouldn't like you to know this, but they figured out how to do analog to digital conversion around 2005. It was pretty much the solved problem. Like, they got it. You can take an interface from 2003, honestly and record an entire album on it and nobody would blink an eye. So they're very, very useful. I had somebody write me from Japan last week where Firewire audio interfaces have just like hit rock bottom there. And he's like, dude, this is so awesome. He was very mm -hmm. excited. He's like, I could buy these things yeah. cheap, <laughs> save a ton of money, and get great quality. And we're not talking about like, um, you know, I'm working on a video right now trying to explain this, but like a little focus, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, if you just want to plug in a microphone and talk into a camera, maybe do some streaming, this is what you need to buy. But if you need to mic up a drum kit, you need to set up, you know, physical mix minuses, you need a bunch of inputs, you want routing capabilities, that's where you can really save some money. So, but that's where the catch is because as much as I like the work that has been done on the Ulsa stack in the kernel, they're not very stable. But Tack would be the first person to tell you that. He's like, mm, these are kind of experimental. And that's what Pipewire has to use in order to support it. So 
that makes pipe wire, fire wire. It's, this is not a good story. So you got to use Fado, and this is this is the tough sell. So I'm like, yo, buy one of these, or I'm going to show you how to get a pro setup with Jack, which might be a little bit fun. But Jill, Firewire's been around a long time, and we can thank uh, oh, Steve Jobs yeah. for killing it single-handedly. Oh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, Apple created it as, you know, uh, a, a better version of their, of their old uh, parallel SCSI, so... And th that was sad when he deprecated it. <laughs> oh, he but didn't I... deprecate it. <laughs> the whole story with Firewire with Steve Jobs is he was licensing it, the technology. Oh, this is why and yeah. what really killed it. It was like super cheap to initially implement. It was a couple of pennies, right? Yeah. So Intel right. was putting okay. it on their boards and other manufacturers was, you know, MSI. Then he's like, you know what? It's going to be like a dollar a port now. And everyone went. New. So then we started seeing USB, and Apple even came back to the negotiating table and like, you know what, we'll we'll do it cheaper. And they're like, yeah, we've already moved on. And this is why we <laughs> had to live with a nightmare. That is USB uh, two and USB three. Like we had a better system. That's what has always bugged me about FireWire. It was a better yes, thing was. than yeah. all of USB two ever thought about being. And most USB three. Hopefully, USB four is going to save us, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything SCSI based is, is always better than USB, <laughs> but USB has gotten better, but yeah. Uh, so I still have a lot of Macs and computers with FireWire ports in them in my vintage computer collection and new computer collection. I've got some FireWire cards and some of my newer systems and, um, I have older video cameras that use FireWire. I used to use them with my students in the classroom and then I have a ton of external FireWire hard drives that I used to use for my animation business back in the 90s. That, that was the hip thing back then to use the external <laughs> FireWire. And they came in handy. I used to have to send those uh, well, drives a lot to of the sense. studios. Like, yeah, yeah, because of big storage needs <laughs> and speed. Big things about uh, FireWire back in those days. And, you know, we were talking about like, oh, look how much power you can put through uh, USB-C. Firewire back in the 90s could throw enough juice down the cable oh. to power a spinning drive, multiple spinning drives. Multiple so you, at once, yeah. And you could daisy chain it. Yeah, that's what I used to do. Firewire right. pass through you. Yeah. There again, it was like the old SCSI standard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm just going to be really sad when it's, if it gets deprecated from the Linux kernel. But I think, like you said, Vin, someone will, will keep it going. Somebody will <laughs> always. Yeah. Keep it around, and and that'll be good. And this this is like really helped me um, storyboard out how I want to do this uh, guide because now we have a known cutoff time, which is not really a cutoff time, but that's going to be official support. And how many things on Linux do you use right now that don't have official support? Think about it. Quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> good news, everybody. So, Yay. Jill, uh, I'm surprised you don't have anything <laughs> blinking behind you. Oh, well, I could. You're gone. <laughs> yes, I could. <laughs> Sick. See, there you go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. Let's see. Uh... <laughs> There's a lot of blinky right there. That, that's legit. <laughs> that's legit. <laughs> okay, so uh, speaking of blinky, the awesome open source project, Open Razor. I'm going to give which... somebody a seizure. Hang on, let me cut that back off. Oh, okay. that's much, isn't it? I could uh, make it a little bit smoother here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Vin's got this going too. Oh, mine, mine's full on rave mode, Jill. I mean, yeah, that's like I, put, this. <laughs> I put mine in smooth color transition mode. <laughs> there we go. God, come yeah. on. There we go. All right, now we're back. <laughs> so yeah, the awesome open source project Open Razor, which was created to get Razor peripherals on Linux fully working, has had a big update and much more hardware support. Woohoo! And the Open Razor driver and daemon doesn't just enable unicorn vomit or rainbow vomit <laughs> on the on the Razor gaming keyboards and mice, but also lets you adjust functions such as brightness, DPI, and polling rate. And there are uh, support for 11 new devices. And so the popular Razer Blade 14 inch laptop and Razer Blade 15 base laptops from 2022 are supported now. Razer Chroma laptop stand 
the Razer Basilisk V3 Pro and Razer Death Adder V2 Lite mice are now supported. And the Razer Deathstalker V2 Pro TKL keyboard, both wired and wireless, are supported. And I have the wireless one, so I'm, I'm <laughs> happy to hear about that. And I actually have been using the OpenRazor software, in fact, before it was even called OpenRazor. I've been using it since it came out for my Razer Black Widow Chroma gaming keyboard and love it. Loved, love it a lot. I still use that on one of my rigs. And in fact, it was the first keyboard I used when I, I came on here podcasting with Linux Gamecast. But I quickly had to change it out because it was a loud uh, blue <laughs> switch keyboard. <laughs> and it was a little too noisy for Ven. <laughs> So I changed that out to the brown keyboard. You don't have to worry about me. It's just a consideration of the people listening. Yeah. <laughs> well, there is that, too. Yeah, you got to put okay. yourself in that thing. You're like, what if you were trying to listen to something you just heard? Clock, 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 clock. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. And I wanted to, you know, the, be a professional broadcaster. Now, so <laughs> here's one of the cool things. I want to do a little bit of research. And um, like, doesn't a lot of this get up, upstreamed into the um, open RGB? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It sure which does. It does. Yeah. And then it's like, oh yeah, open RGB. That's been it's like apparently because I felt like the initial post from the uh, Open Razor guy when he announced the project. He's like, hey, this is out, and that Open Razor is the first one. There was a project before Open Razor that he based some of his stuff on. It turns out, like, yes, Open R RGB yeah. is like the new kid on the block. Because my first thought was like, why don't we just? Because I don't want the ecosystem that exists on Windows to be on Linux, where we have. 16 where you have to have nine different apps i know such to a control the rgb stuff but fortunately yeah. this stuff is kind of and i'd like but come to find out the open razor stuff is still upstream to open rgb mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and i was looking at some of the open razor apps i mean that's pretty slick isn't it? oh yeah they're really really nice i mean i i i love uh uh, open RGB too, but the Open Razor app because it's been around more. Some of it looks a little better. I would huh. throw that keyboard like, in the trash. Like like the the adjusting all the LED colors on the keyboard is a little more sophisticated than Open RGBs. But that's Open RGB RGB is getting better. And again, Open Razor was first, so it was you know the first application to support the Razor products. That's and it was snack. forked. Yeah, it was <laughs> forked from another project that I had used when it was in beta. And the reason I I bought my original uh, Black Widow, Widow Chroma Black mechanical. <laughs> Black Widow. <laughs> Black Widow. I missed Chroma. that Marvel film. How did it go? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Then>. So the reason I bought, <laughs> I bought the Black Widow Chroma original gaming keyboard is to try and get it to work on Linux. And I did because of their software. <laughs> you mean to try and make it blink under Linux? Yeah, trying to make it blink. What What's nice is, of course, the keyboard, when I would turn it on, it would go into default uh, changing color modes. But with their software, you know, I can adjust each, each key. Is it, and... Was it wireless? It's It was wired. Oh, great, because it was, it was easier to throw in the trash when it started blinking, right? Like, you know, yeah. Didn't plug anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you could, you know, you didn't have to use the blinky aspect of it, but I, I trying to get it to change change the colors for the games you play. That's a little bit more of a challenge, but they've gotten better at that. It's and, usually not like too bad eh? on um, yeah. my MSI because RGB capabilities that's on everything these days. Every yeah, it's on everything now. Motherboards. It was on a B three fifty Telehawk motherboard. Yeah, but and back in 2015, that wasn't a thing in Linux. <laughs> well, this is like the original Ryzen 7. So we're talking like six, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've never intentionally bought anything blinky, but it's hard to get away oh. from it these days. And I, like yeah. on that motherboard, I clipped the LEDs and just got in there and took them mm -hmm. out because I couldn't control them. Nor did I want to. That's really fascinating. One thing I saw earlier, I think maybe last week, Microsoft's going to quit making because, hey, you want something that doesn't blink? Microsoft has a great keyboard for you. Yeah. It doesn't even have an LED light yeah. on it anywhere. <laughs> you gotta have a backlight at least. <laughs> Nothing. It's awesome. And uh, they're going to quit making these. They're going to quit making the IntelliMouse stuff too. Yeah, that's their peripherals. Sad. That's some of their best, best uh, peripherals. Yeah. They're going to make, uh, they're still going to continue their Surface line, to which I think maybe like a lot of you in the office is like a Surface line. Where's our Surface line? I'm like, oh, that's the same thing, but it's like $90 more. Mm hmm. 
Boo. Poor Vin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor a lot of people, actually. I know a lot of people still love using their keyboards and mice. And I have some myself. Well, yeah. And I mean, you want a good quality keyboard uh, that doesn't blink and doesn't shout at you when you touch it. And the battery lasts a long time. That's uh, another reason why <laughs> I like Logitech wireless keyboards, because the batteries last a long time. <laughs> this one's been very surprising on this keyboard. They said, uh, like, the number pad's supposed to get, like, 10 years on the number pad. Oh, And I okay. think the uh, keyboard's, like, four to six. So what am I thinking? I'm like, yeah, what, maybe two years, man? Cool. We're, we're deep into year four right now on the original, like, batteries that came in the box, to the point where I'm like, these are going to die sometimes. Over a year ago, I bought a set of rechargeable AAAs. They're still mm-hmm. in the package. Because I see them every now and then. I'm like, why did I buy those? Oh, right. Huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fascinating. We're going to tell you about how to create a pirate radio station in just a moment. But before we do that, if you like what we do, you want to support us, you can head over to linuxemcast.com. We got one of those little Patreon things, a bunch of rewards. You can come hang out with us in Discord, get access to our show notes and all the other fun stuff if you want to. Go over there, patreon.com forward slash Linux Teamcast. Under the support button, we got merch, we got Amazon wish list, uh, donato buttons, all the stuff. But if you can, share the show. Come watch us live. Yeah. Give us a thumbs sideways or whatever you do on social <laughs> media these days. I don't know, man. Stars. Give us stars, stars. or hearts. That's what it used to be on Twitter, man. Because I yeah. was like, it's like, I thought that was weird. Because it used to be a star, you'd click it, then it changed to a heart. I know. And I'm like, then it changed. <laughs> yeah, it did. Change it to a hot dog or a yeah. corn dog. <laughs> I don't know. We do appreciate your support. Uh, thanks for letting us do what we do. Loud, live, independent, commercial free. And uh, yeah, go download the show, watch the show. We're available everywhere, including Odyssey, mm-hmm. Spotify. And Spotify, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Spotify on video, too. <laughs> you know what? Spotify was really rough when it started out with a video because I was on. Um, when it first started rolling out and I was testing it in production with them and uh, it, I, I can upload something, I can upload a video to Spotify and it'll get processed usually faster than YouTube these days. YouTube has turned into like a game of RNG when you upload the video. It could take seven minutes or it could be like not last <laughs> yeah. Saturday, Saturday before last, six hours to process uh, this video. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's fun times. Hey, uh, come hang out with us on Tuesdays and Fridays. If you like me and Joel, or if you just like yeah. Joel, maybe you just like me, or maybe you just like Chet, because Chet shows up too. We do yeah. track Mania Squared. That's uh, LinuxGameCast.com. All the information, everything's pinned in our Discord channel. Retro racing at this point, because the game's like 12 years old, and uh, yeah. we do 14 maps each and every week, custom curated. I look them up. I make sure they're kind of fun, a little bit challenging, puzzle platforming. Now, it took a long time. Oh, radio cake. To find a cake. And radio cake. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you, you go to Google Images and you type in diabetes cake. <laughs> radio. <Yeah. laughs> and you eventually find it. <laughs> this is what we're talking about. Pico AM. That's right. A raspberry pie that you can actually buy for under $100. And they are available. Because I think if you're a certain age... Mm-hmm. You probably at least had the thought about running a pirate radio station. It might have been on your to-do list of, you know, as a teenager or young adult. Now, you can play the home version with a Pipeco, just a little bit of wire. All you have to do, you just got to flash through Arduino IDE. Pretty simple, you know, out of the box, you don't have to do any extra configuration. It takes one capacitor, one resistor, and tune in to 1557 AM, because you're going to be on the air. And I love this Yay. reading through it because there's like 11 warnings and disclaimers yes. to keep that antenna <laughs> short because scaling this would be extremely simple to do. And um, you want something that's only going to broadcast in your room. It makes it even funny. It's like, man, I have this thing so low wattage that it covers like half the room. And that's the right way to do it because you don't want to be stepping on other people's frequencies. Mm-hmm. because yeah. that gets people out in vans Trouble. looking for you. <laughs> and um, I want to point out it does overclock the Pi Pico to I think like 200 megahertz. So you probably didn't, unless you have some active cooling on it, don't run it 24-7. But I think just to play around with, I, 
where was the stuff when I was like nine? I right? know. I would have loved that. I mean, I, I built an old um, AM Heathkit radio. Heathkit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, this thing is so dead simple. Uh, he yeah. said, the, unfortunately, the Pico's not fast enough to do a frequency modulation. Oh, okay. So you're not going to be able to do an FM, FM channel. FM, yeah. But, yeah, this is so simple to build. Now, I guess the challenge would be finding a radio. But, I mean, if you get one laying around, uh, build it. Again, not too much speaker wire, though. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this, this is an incredible project. But I, I'm so happy the author... Uh, talked about, you know, with those warnings, keeping that antenna short. Or you might have the FCC knocking on your door, <laughs> telling you to stop transmitting and or pay thousands of dollars. That's the, uh, <laughs> well, again, I, I can just imagine like eight-year-old me, man, I'd be, I'm shooting like yeah. I was doing with the ham radio, just shooting the lines over the trees with the antenna oh. to get them up in the air, man. I'm like, all right, let's do this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I actually have learned this from experience working at a local college ra AM radio station here in Los Angeles where the AM radio band is oversaturated. And it's actually very hard to control the radiation of, of the AM frequency. Amplitude or, modulation. Yeah, amplitude modulation or, the, or, you know, the distance traveled because the way the signal travels in the atmosphere and bounces back to Earth. In fact, that's why you can get a skip from an AM radio station from your hometown, even while traveling in another country. And I, I, I know that from experience, too, because all my AM radio stations I used to listen to here in uh, L.A., I could get down at my house in Mexico. <laughs> so because of a skip on the ocean. So that, yeah. That, that good on you, uh, author, for for <laughs> make, just like uh, be putting careful those words. with it. Yeah, you just got to be careful. Yeah, you can't actually do pirate radio these days, <laughs> so you get in trouble. <laughs> uh, it's going to come less than like new cars these days. Don't even ship with AM. Yeah, I know, I know, and you know, uh, Ven, you know, Ven and I both had worked in AM radio, and it actually costs more for an AM radio license than it does an FM one. <sighs> Found out that <laughs> yeah. because it's harder to control. It's just oh, it, it <sighs> proposes different in engineering challenges. But usually on towers, yeah. you can have hey, your AM end because I mean, yeah, Clear Channel owns everything. They got the AM FM on the same towers these days. Yeah, um, that's true. Yeah, and digital now. Now they do digital, or they do like our KNX news radio uh it, it does uh, both am and fm because it's a clear channel so they have am and fm and then you got the um hd radio carrier on top yeah. of everything oh else. yeah that's the other yeah i have i do have a receiver do you have one <laughs> think, oh absolutely not Joe. Yeah. i'm not a hipster <laughs> i don't <laughs> i have but yeah these are things you learn also when you get an am uh, radio license, which I did, and I, I'm I'm sure Ven has one too. <laughs> a license, work. yeah, AM radio license. <laughs> Don't have a license to broadcast. <laughs> so, um, what was the license required for? Uh, uh, uh DJing at uh, some of the big radio stations here, like um, uh, KFI and uh, KNX. <laughs> A lot of the big stations. They required that if you were when did that, uh When did that go? Like, when did they stop doing that? I think like 2000s or something like that. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. That'll be something to look into, but yeah, we're going to have to look into the rearview window and bounce out of here. <laughs> it's fun talking to you. We'll see you again next week. And let's uh, roll oh, some yeah, Mar Mars FM. Mars all, uh, I, <laughs> I interned at Mars FM <laughs> and KFI. Do, do, do. Advisors, we have awesome advisors, Amagus and Artharin. We have awesome executive producers and Chicago level people, super dust out, empty, blasphemy. We got all, lots of awesome sea monsters and lots of cool death notes. There's so many, I can't name them all. We 
thank you all and to all our beautiful chairlings. And to all a good night. Yes. <laughs> All right, beautiful people. We'll see you again next week. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.